everyone, and welcome to uh, our web session today, the um, introduction to PLM on the 3D Experience platform and its business impacts. My name is Nick Gaffari. I belong to the PLM team here at the Solid Experience Group, and my team and I have been working with 3D Experience uh, exclusively for the last six years, um, covering all aspects of um, the 3D Experience platform from uh, consulting work, training, uh, implementation, and even development on the 3D Experience platform. So I'm excited to take some time today um, to sit down with all of you and, and give you guys an introduction to uh, the Inovia brand specifically and, and the different PLM tools that are available on the 3D Experience platform. So just to quickly go over the, um, the focus, uh, the agenda that we have today, uh, we got a few bullet points here. Um, you don't need to get too caught up into this and take any notes. Um, it's going to be mostly, we're going to spend most of our time in the software, walking through it. And uh, this is basically just the one slide uh, in PowerPoint that we're going to have. So um, we're going to go through the look and feel uh, of, the, of the 3D Experience platform. We're going to talk about uh, searching and filtering capabilities, which are very important to this particular PLM. Um, BOM and multi-CAD data management, um, another very important feature, a really empowering feature with, uh, with 3D Experience PLM. Um, change management is something we'll go through a formal uh, release process and we'll talk about a 150% configured bill of materials as well. So yeah, let's, uh, let's get right into it if you're all ready. So to start off with the 3D Experience platform, you'll be on a web page like this and this will be your door to 3D Experience. And in this post-pandemic world of ours, this is really nice because once you have your URL, your users will be able to connect to it remotely from anywhere in the world. The platform is completely geographically independent. And for example, we, we actually have a customer who has a main site in the US in California, and they've also got teams working remotely from Germany and from China seamlessly on the same platform. And it's as simple as this. As far as the user is concerned, they have a URL, a username, and a password, and they're equipped to connect and start working with the various applications uh, assigned to them. So I'll go ahead and connect here with my credentials. And as soon as I click login, the first thing you'll notice is the look and feel. The user interface is very modular and dashboard centric. A lot of the work that you'll be doing will be within this web client on these dashboards, and you'll be dragging and dropping data around from searches uh, in a very intuitive way. And then if you're a CAD user, as need be, you'll be able to call up your CAD authoring tool from here and do some work in whatever CAD client that you'll need. Now, this compass in the top left portion of the screen, depending on if you've bought 3D Experience on the cloud or if you're hosting it locally on-premises, it'll look a little different, but it serves the same purpose. In our case, this is an on-premises installation. And as we navigate through the compass, this is where we go to access all of the licensed applications that are assigned to our user. In the Western quadrant, we have all of our 3D CAD-centric applications. In, in my case, I have a bunch of CATIA 3DX applications available to me here. And in this particular instance, I also have access to CATIA V5 and SOLIDWORKS. And it also supports other CADs such as NX, Creo, Inventor. But for this particular webinar, we'll, we'll be focusing on the PLM aspects of the platform. So we won't dive too much into the CAD tools. Although we will jump in and give you a peek at the SOLIDWORKS connector. The Southern Quadrant is where you'll find all the tools and applications related to the Delmia and Sumulia brands of the Deso portfolio. So this will be all of your robotics, manufacturing bill of materials, simulation tools to do uh, FEM, fluid analysis, or what have you. The Eastern Quadrant we won't be spending too much time on today is where you'll find your analytics data dashboarding roles. The Northern Quadrant is where you'll find the bulk of the Inovia applications, which will be used for life cycle, bomb management, and so on, which we'll be getting more in depth into today. So the way you'll mostly get started to kick off a task and start working on something is with a search at the top of the page. I'm going to kick off a search, uh, just a wild color card search for PRD, and PRD here represents products in 3D Experience, and everything you have in 3D Experience is a product which may or may not hold CAD. And you have these useful tags on the left-hand side of the screen where you can filter the data. Obviously, if you have the part number or description of what you're looking for, you can type it in and find it, but if you want to have a funneling search capability, you can use these tags. So for example, here I have collaborative spaces, and this is the answer to the question, 
where is my data stored? You can create as many of these collaborative spaces as need be and use them to segregate and control access to these spaces and the content within them. Uh, if different teams are working on different projects, for example, or if you're a build to print shop, you can have collaborative spaces defined per supplier or client. So there's different ways to define these spaces depending on your needs. So in this case, if I want to see all the data uh, or the products that correspond to that uh, collaborative space, that tram collaborative space, if I click on it, I could see that I've reduced the search results down to only those products that belong to my tram space. And then let's say I want to see everything that is currently in work. And for example, I could see here that this collaborative space, uh, in this collaborative space, I have 80% of my data, which is in work, 15%, which is released and so on. I can say, let me see everything that is in work. So the results get filtered even more. And then since my environment here is multi-CAD, if I want to reduce it to the elements which are only designed in SOLIDWORKS, I can do so. And you can see here that for our little demo today, I only have these two elements designed in SOLIDWORKS. So this is how I would shrink the pool of products that are of interest to me. So if you don't know a specific part number, you can use these tags to locate the product that you're after. Now, in my case, I won't need the tags because I wish to load a root product, a root node product. So I can just type in root uh, at the top of the screen. And in this case, the system will return to me all of my top level products that I have access to in the system. So in this case, I'm interested in my tram product. So I'll go ahead and I'll just drag it and I'll drop it into the application on my dashboard, the very first widget application that we'll be talking about today, which is called the Product Structure Editor. So let me quickly just restructure a little bit the bill of materials, again, just dragging and dropping. So we'll put the description, revision, the maturity state, and I like to have the CAD master column because you'll, as you'll recall, I have various different types of CAD models that I manage inside of this 3D experience instance, as we saw earlier from the search. So as you can see on the right hand side of the screen, we have the 3D view of the CAD, regardless of what CAD was used to generate 3D. So this is a great way to have the people in your organization who are not CAD authors to allow them to consume the CAD data that was saved inside of the platform via the web browser. With the basic licensing of 3D experience, you can have the split view of the bill of materials in the CAD. So if I expand my structure, this will give you an idea of how the product architect was separating uh, the structure. This could be useful for someone who's coming into the company uh, to have a clear idea of how the product is structured. So if it's automotive, it could be powertrain, electronics, and so forth. But in this case, you can see I have, um, I have an associativity between the bill of materials and the corresponding 3D on the right, which gives me a quick understanding of how the product is severed, how it is separated depending on the methodology and use uh, at, uh, at my uh, clients. And then looking at the 3D viewer, it has a lot of interesting functionalities for a non-CAD user. I can take my product and do some sectioning. I can also do some measurements. There's various tools that can be quite useful for a non-CAD user within your organization to extract information, not just from the bill of materials, but also the associated 3D. And in the same way, as I've mentioned before, when we're talking about the search in 3DX, we work with products, which are, if you will, the cornerstone of the PLM on the platform. The products can manage CAD models if you have some, but they can also manage documents. We also have customers in our customer base that use 3D experience as a corporate document management system. So in this case, we've just associated a couple of documents here. I have a promotional video that Perhaps I'd like to send to my customers. So my CAD people might've just created this animation and I can store it with the root node. At the same time, I have a PDF presentation, but this could be Excel, Word, or any document format you can think of. And like anything else in 3DX, the document as well as the product or any other item saved into the platform comes with its own unique identifier with its own revision. And you can have your lifecycle revisioning uh, approval scheme on them, as we'll see later on. The idea is that the product here can manage CAD, but it can also manage documents or just documents, depending on what you need it to do. 
So now I just like to shrink the bomb back down and bring us back to that split view we had with the 3D. What I want to show you now on the 3D is another way we have, another way we can exploit the structure of our root node uh, via the edit structure command that I have here. So in this case, the one thing that will stand out and something I wanted to show you is that this is a configured product. So the product architect is managing some variance on this particular tram over here. So if we keep drilling down into the structure, we can see uh, here as far as the body is concerned, we'll center the tree. So we can see it in the bomb that that 341 wagon body, which comes with these two windows in the center. And if we center the tree on the green one, just to focus on, on the bomb, we see the 345 body. And this could be perhaps for another customer, which requires slightly different parameters and a slightly different structure. So in this case, we can visually see the difference. Instead of two windows, we have one wider one in the center. And another thing we'll see during the presentation is that we have another variant that the product architect has introduced into the, this system that uh, we're going to have two different types of powertrains for our mock-up. So you can see at the bottom, we have the powertrain with the single engine and the other variant on top has the, uh, is the twin engine one. So we can visually see that this is a configured structure and we'll see later on how we can leverage some of those configurations to configure our bill of materials. So we can have the bill of materials that might correspond to a specific model year, a specific model, or if we're a build to print shop, a specific configuration that we're selling to a customer. So now let's expand this bill of materials all the way down to our leaf nodes. And we can see that we have the full structure available and the associativity with the 3D remains, whether it's for the root nodes, intermediate nodes, all the way down to the leaf nodes. And another neat tool that's available to product managers, or if I'm just a web user that doesn't have a CAD license slash CAD tool, I can leverage the same tags that we had in the search, but this time, to color code the information that I wish to see in my bill of materials and 3D. So we can say, for example, that I want to see the maturity state of this particular product. So I can activate this color palette, and this is going to parse through the product structure, and it will tell me the maturity state of the elements which make up my mock-up. So at a glance, I can see what has been released, what's frozen and waiting approvals, and what people are currently working on. So here we can see that all the blue stuff are parts that I might be reusing, that I have um, released and sent to the ERP system, that I'm purchasing, and so on. Everything in orange are, that you see are things that are awaiting approval. And everything in yellow uh, that we see are the elements that my designers are currently working on. So again, it's quite useful to have that sort of bird's eye view on the evolution of the product from a release standpoint. And in the same way, I can leverage the CAD master tag to visualize the CAD mockup uh, makeup of the of the structure rather. So I can see that this mockup is built by the architect down to the designer using both SolidWorks and CATIA 3DX. So I have some elements which are CATIA 3DX. Actually, the bulk of my tram here is built by my CATIA 3DX designers. But for one reason or another, maybe this is uh, one element that I received from a supplier that only uses SOLIDWORKS or uh, it's a legacy because maybe I used to use SOLIDWORKS and then I switched to Katia 3DX or better still, uh, I, I continue to have teams of people using SOLIDWORKS that continue to evolve these elements. And you can see that I, I have some SOLIDWORKS element that are stored in my mockup. Now I'd like to examine the SOLIDWORKS data a little further. in. In this case, if I do a center tree on the dashboard, it'll take me to the uh, MEC 16944 part number. And if we slide down the bill of materials, we can once again see that this is designed in SOLIDWORKS. Now, mind you, this could also be CATIA V5 or any other CAD supported by 3D Experience, but this is a SOLIDWORKS launch event. So we'll try to shine the light uh, a little bit more on the SOLIDWORKS aspect. So. This gives us a chance, if you haven't already seen it, to show you the SOLIDWORKS integration with 3D Experience really quick. Really just to highlight that at the end of the day, it really doesn't matter what 
CAD tool you're using. Uh, if, if there's some features in 3D Xcatia that you'd like to exploit, you can use those and still use SolidWorks as well. Now let's say we'd like to do some modifications on that 16944 part. We know it's designed in SolidWorks, so we can open our compass, which as you'll recall, contains all of our applications, including SolidWorks. And we can look for and simply click on the SolidWorks icon to launch SolidWorks and call up the information that, that we're requesting here. It'll just prompt me to log in, so I'll go ahead and log in. And when it launches, I'll call up the SolidWorks model. It'll call up the SolidWorks model uh, that we had selected from 3D Experience and open it inside of SolidWorks without me having to uh, go and look for the file in, in folders on a file system or anything. So in this tram, this dashboard part evolves in SolidWorks by a team of SolidWorks designers. So the SolidWorks users will have this slide in panel here, which contains all of the standard lifecycle operations I'd want to do, such as obviously saving, maturity, revisioning, and so on to be able to modify this data live. Uh, live data, meaning as soon as I, I modify anything here, it'll automatically propagate and be available to anyone else in the system uh, that might be on the web browser for users who may not have access to SolidWorks. It'll be immediately available to them. And this 3D Experience slide in panel here has the same look and feel as what I have in the web browser where I can search at the top uh, for elements which are saved inside of 3D Experience. And once again, I can use the tags to get after, for instance, uh, only the SOLIDWORKS data since I'm in SOLIDWORKS. And I can open up those models inside of SOLIDWORKS, save them back into 3D Experience, and so on. And for a long time, the understanding most people had about 3D Experience was that it was essentially just CATIA v6. But the takeaway here really is that you don't have to switch your CAD authoring tool to leverage the PLM capabilities of the 3D Experience platform. So your teams can keep working with their preferred authoring tool, be it SolidWorks, and it doesn't make a difference. You could still use all the PLM capabilities of 3D Experience. Now let's go back to the product structure editor on the web and collapse everything to start fresh. I want to revisit what we touched on earlier when we talked about and I showed you the variants that I have in my mock-up for instance those powertrain units with the different motor options so we'll keep drilling in the 3d until we get down to them and in the bill of materials we see that the architect has split the powertrain into motor and pneumatics and we're interested in the motor and under the motor, we have the single drive units as well as the dual motor units. And I can, just to demonstrate, I can right click here and enter the properties of that node there. Uh, just to illustrate to you how you have a ton of properties that you can introspect on each node and you can add your own properties uh, or attributes rather to your products. That's done easily with an administrative panel that's easy to use for an admin. Uh, user, you don't need to have any coders or geniuses to figure out how to do it. And I'd like to point out that, uh, as a side note, that everything I'm showing you is on an environment which isn't customized at all. It's configured uh, just using out-of-the-box features and options. So in this case, for show and tell purposes, I just added some costing information, such as the local currency for this particular part, and I defined my supplier as well as my supplier part number, which I can compare to my own internal part number. And I also have my equivalent US dollar costs and so on and so forth. You can add as many of these attributes as you need depending on what your processes are. So now leveraging again, some of the same themes and useful features we talked about earlier, we're, we're going to turn on our tags, the same tags and we'll head over to the maturity state color coding and apply it again. And we're going to see very visually that one of these elements has been released and the other one is frozen. Specifically, the single motor variant on the bottom is released while the dual motor is frozen. 
And frozen here could mean that it's waiting for approval, right? And, and here it's worthwhile spending a minute to just discuss the whole life cycle and releasing scheme of 3D experience and the options that you have to release your data. We have some customers that don't necessarily want to go through a whole formal uh, change management process. And those customers can say, well, these users can bring the data to release without a formal process because we're a small enough team and we don't need it. We then have some customers which want to have some level of control. So they're going to decide that most team members will be declared with a role that won't allow them to release their data. And there'll be a few leader users that will be granted the permission to release. And that's like an intermediate level of formality. And then what we'll demonstrate here, because it's a process that's used quite commonly across our customer base, is the whole formal change management process. So if we close out the tags here and in the BOM, even without the colors, we can see the correspondence of the maturity states, both released and frozen, as we saw with the tags. And for this frozen assembly, the 16920 dual motor assembly, it's frozen, so it's under the review, and there's been a change action open on this to be able to pass an approval from specific stakeholders to be able to release it and eventually send it to an ERP by potentially using that release mechanism as a trigger to activate your interface to an ERP system. We have some larger customers, for instance, that have integrated 3D experience with the likes of SAP, just as an example. So to get to the approval, what we can do is we can change our dashboard. And if we go to our dashboard number one, inside of this dashboard, I've created tabs which correspond to what could be my activities and my role within the organization. So in this case, I have this change management tab onto which I've dropped this change action application. And so if I click this change action, we're saying that with as I've said before, uh, everything inside of 3D Experience has its own identifier and revision scheme and life cycle. So in this case, my CA48 is created in order to review and approve the proposed dual motor assembly. I can define members. In this case, it's a very simple assignment. I say I'm the owner and the reviewer. My colleague Peter is the assignee to which I might delegate some CAD work if I'm not happy with what's being proposed to me. And Tien here is just a follower who will be notified as this change progresses. In fact, all of these people will receive emails with respect to what happens to that dual motor assembly. So Tien here might not be called upon to do anything, but he'll still be informed since he's a project leader and needs to know what happens to this assembly. In this case, the The proposed change that I gave is that the 16920 dual motor assembly is frozen and I'm proposing this change action to transition the assembly to the release state. And I've given the change action some referential documents for whoever is responsible to manage this particular change action. I've referenced the, the single motor assembly so they can compare it as a reference. If I'm involved in the life cycle of this change action, which aims to release the dual motor assembly, I have everything I need to be able to visualize what's being asked of me uh, with the tools that, that we've seen to date. So again, if I don't have a SolidWorks license, I don't need to, it's too expensive. Not everyone needs to have SolidWorks. So I just need to use these applications inside of 3D Experience on the web. And since I wanna see the 3D and potentially the 2D, I'm going to head back into the compass to fetch an application called Product Explorer. And this will allow me to visualize the CAD and BOM as we saw earlier. So I drag it and drop it onto my dashboard. I reorganize it to my liking. And you can see how easy it is to rearrange your user interface to suit your personal preferences. And now that it's arranged the way I like it, I can drag and drop the product onto the app. And I'll have the same look and feel as I had before with the bomb and the 3D. And as I scroll down, I can see that I also have a drawing associated to this. So since I'm being called into question to approve this element, I also want to visualize the 2D. And for that, 
I have another app which I can fetch to allow me to do that. So I go back to the compass and I fetch my 3D Play app and drop it onto the dashboard. And now I could just drag and drop my 2D onto it. Now, in this case, it's a Katia 3DX drawing, but it can just as easily be a SolidWorks drawing. So it's just going to load the drawing in the viewer in a lightweight fashion. And I have an idea of what's been created in this element and I have some, some productivity tools by which I can add some text here to say, for instance, motor. OK, KO, and so on. I can then choose to save a snapshot of this or print it or share it across to my communities in 3D Swim. So already I'm able to visualize and see everything that I need. But since someone went to the trouble of adding this referential document to my change action, I want to be able to compare that referential document to the change that's being proposed of me. Uh, and for this, I have an application that I put on another tab. I could have put it on here on the same page, but for the sake of not cluttering the user interface too much, I put it on another tab. So I have the compare tab with a compare app on it. And I'm going to go ahead and search for that 16920 assembly. and drag it onto the compare app. I'll also go fetch the single motor 16866 assembly and drag it onto the other side of the compare app and that'll launch a comparison between the two. And this is a really useful, neat feature that's really well done because now I have a side-by-side -side visual comparison of the changes that happen between the single motor and the dual motor assembly. At the graphical level on the right, And I also see what's changing in the bill of materials. So I have the elements here that are only available in the dual motor, as well as the elements that might only be available in the single motor. I can single those out and I can even export the results of this comparison to Excel. So again, quite useful if I'm brought in to a decisional workflow or if I have to give my approval and so on. So now I validate that everything looks good with the dual motor assembly and I can go ahead and promote my change action to the in approval state. And then if I'm happy and maybe I have two or three directors that need to approve this, I can just go ahead and give it the okay. And as soon as this is done, every element that was proposed in a frozen state to be released is going to be formally released. And everyone that now goes into the platform to look for that 16920 assembly is going to see it as released along with the corresponding 2D. So this whole workflow, as soon as the organization becomes structured, or if you have a larger organization like some of our customers, You'll likely need this style of formal change approvals, and you'll be doing it on the web inside of 3D Experience within these dashboards, which are very intuitive, and it's often just a matter of dragging and dropping data and apps around, as I've shown you. But other organizations might not want to go through that whole formal releasing scheme, so they might just choose to instead create issues, which we can assign to a specific person and say, hey, Peter, have a look at this. This is what's been happening. These are the elements that are impacted. I can drag and drop information to give the assignee some context. I can put an image on there to give them an idea of, hey, this is what broke. Please have a look at it. And we can also track all of the discussions that took place in order to bring the issue towards resolution. And you can pass through a whole formal approval process uh, through a change action or just open and close the issue without a change action. It's just another way of working. And there's yet another informal way of working through tasks that you can assign to users because maybe I have a distributed team 
and I can just create some tasks and assign them to Peter, assign them to Joe, and they'll move it from in progress all the way to done. And that's yet another way that you can manage your collaboration without going into a full formal change management approval process. And even though uh, this is kind of a PLM on 3DX overview, we can take a minute to also have a look at some of the other things that a non-CAD user can do. I have this FEM tag that um, I may have a team of engineers that did a simulia stress analysis on this particular component, so I can potentially also add this simulation result to my change action to show my director the results of a change that we did on this particular model. And that's really interesting because you have this whole slew of processes now that you can uh, combine uh, from different teams inside of 3D Experience to manage all the data uh, that's coming through all these different applications on the web and make them available to your whole organization. So for example, you have your CAD designer, your simulation engineer, perhaps the person responsible for your manufacturing bill of materials and all the data that they generate is centered around the same content definition and all lives within the same platform. And depending on the roles that I have and the applications which I have access to, I build my own personalized view of my 3D experience environment. Okay. So as our time is advancing and we're nearing the end of our session, let's go back to the first dashboard and application that I showed you today, our product structure editor, because there's another functionality that Deso has worked extensively on in the last few years, and it's at a point where it looks really great on the web because back in previous releases for a very long time, this was something that you were only able to do using Katia 3D Experience, Katia V6, and now you can do it on the web and with SolidWorks data too. So let's say you start developing a product and as that product matures, you feel the need to have variants to manage your model years, to manage various options or the date with which you want to send it to production. And so you have a configured structure that you can use an author on the web so we'll pick up our root product, our tram again. As you'll recall, this was a configured structure. So this would be a 150% bill of materials. And let's give you some insight on how the bill of materials is going to be configured. So you can see here that I have the motor structural node, which in this example, I've, I've given it a separate part number. So that's just going to be a structure node, which is going to contain two different variants or two possibilities, which are either the single or the dual motor. And then there's other uh, variants. For example, I have the HVAC node here with various possibilities. So in this example, I have a handful of variations of the product, but say you're, you're in the automotive industry or in the aerospace industry, um, we have customers that manage hundreds and thousands of these options, which they can choose to send to an ERP later on. But in this case, we're going to keep it simple due to the simple nature of this, this overview webinar. So the way to configure this product is that I can use the filter tool in the action bar and I can go ahead and choose the configuration that was given to me by the product architect. So in a typical scenario, you'd have a product architect or a product manager, which will work with marketing or production and they'll create a whole configuration dictionary which is going to be made available to all the downstream users. So in this case, I have some very simple product configurations to choose from. Um, so in this example, I create trams. So I have this iTram platform that I'm working on and I've landed contracts to supply these three cities. So what I want to see, let's say I want to see the San Francisco model that I'll be delivering to the city of San Francisco. Um, I want to see what that would look like. So I'm just going to go and ch choose that configuration and this will contain a series of variants. And in an industrial context, you might expect uh, hundreds of these features and options and not a handful, but here I'll configure the product, my iTram product with the dual motor and the double width windows on the body, uh, low density seating and a specific HVAC system. So I apply this and when I do, the structure is going to be filtered. Now, if I examine the 3D visually, as we did before, we can see that if we go to the seats this time, I have just one row of seats, and that's because it's the low density one. And if we go back to the powertrain and look at the motor, uh, 
we can see that now I only have the dual motor option selected. And if I expand the BOM structure, going back to the powertrain, all I see is the dual motor drive unit. And by that same token, I can go ahead and apply another configuration. So let's get rid of the San Francisco one and I'll go and this time I'll pick the Istanbul one. And I'll just go ahead and apply that. This time, right away, you can tell I have a different product structure, which will contain now a single motor drive, high density seating with a different HVAC and body. And in the bomb, I can expand it all. And then if I want to send it to a customer or export it to be consumed by another system or process, I have the possibility to export it and I can send it to Excel so that I can share the information with people that may or may not have access to my 3D experience environment. So this is just another type of process that we manage quite extensively for many of our customers, especially in the automotive industry. And we get lots of questions. We're asked lots of questions about this. So I thought it would be great to squeeze this into our PLM on 3DX introduction, just to show you how smooth and easy it can be. And with that, I would say that more or less concludes this session for, for everything that I wanted to show you today on the types of PLM processes that you can manage, things that we often see or do for most of our clients. Um, and I hope I was able to convey to you what 3D Experience is in a more PLM-centered approach with some of the PLM process that it, processes that it can manage and what it can do. Honestly, it's a, it's a very vast platform, so this is just kind of scratching the surface. We can go even more into specifics like MBOM, quality management, and so on. But we wanted to just take this, uh, this time slot to introduce you to the platform and to some of the typical PLM processes that we manage for our customers. And following this, I'm sure we'll have other sessions in the future to dive into specific processes uh, more into detail. But by all means, if, if you have any questions or even if you have any suggestions for other topics that you'd like to see, and if, it, if you want us to build on anything that you may have seen or, or liked uh, in today's showcase, please let us know and we can uh, get back to you or we can build some content around that and share that across with you. So I would say stay tuned. I'm sure there's a lot more great content to come and, and thank you for attending this, uh, this showcase. Thank you.